Is Magic the Gathering Arena rigged? Let's find out together, experimentally. The theory that that's the case gets thrown around online from time to time, and I've even seen it in my own comments once or twice. A lot of it seems like general, non-specific saltiness towards the game overall, but once we sift through the complaints that are obviously someone having lost one too many times, we get to the more interesting bit. Three areas that these opinions see the rigging happening in are matchmaking, going first, and cards that you get in your initial draw. I'm gonna disregard that first one. It's a bit opaque, I don't have access to that much data on it, and I don't feel like it's going to look especially impressive once I'm done analyzing it. But for the other two, the likelihood of going first and the likelihood of getting screwed in your initial seven, those are both interesting and verifiable. To crystallize my hypotheses fully, I'd look for a motivation why WotC might mess with the system in these two places. I find it unlikely that it's a personal vendetta against these commenters specifically. I might buy it that one of them cut in line in front of Gavin Verhey, but probably not all of them. Another idea I've seen expressed online is that the bias is in favor of paying players and to the detriment of F2P ones. Wizards would take these actions in the hopes of keeping their paying customers happy, as them being happy makes the company more money. So our two hypotheses to check for are going to be that fully F2P players go first at a different rate than paying ones, and the second one is that fully F2P players get worse opening hands than paying players. To confirm both of these hypotheses, I downloaded a truly insane amount of Arena streamer footage and combined that with my own gameplay recordings. I opted for unedited footage here to minimize the impact of content creators selecting which games go into edited videos. This will obviously vary from creator to creator, but many of them will not put, for example, non-games, games that ended super quickly for one reason or another, into an edited video like a deck deck, because it's not especially interesting and it's not especially informative. Pulling from these edited videos, then, would bias our sample towards being a reflection of the more competitive games instead of games overall, and we want a reflection of games overall. Going for unedited footage fixes that problem. However, it presents another in that it's a whole lot of footage. So I decided to run an OCR engine on the video files to extract the exact frames in which opening hands are visible. OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition, which is fancy speak for a piece of software that's able to tell when and what text is present in an image. Badly, for the most part. I set it up to snapshot frames where the top 10% of the image included the phrases you go first or opponent goes first, since that's a pretty much ironclad criterion for the opening hands being visible. Then I set it to snapshot the frames 15 after that instead, since all the ones I got initially were dark as shit. Then I introduced a fuzzy match for the phrases it was looking for, so it would match on phrases that were, you know, 80% of the ones specified, since apparently the OCR I was using, Tesseract, struggles with reading the arena font, on some letters at least, resulting in opponent becoming ononent or synonent from time to time. So it would snap when it saw something that was 80% of one of the phrases, at least. After a whole host of performance improvements, since many of these videos are upwards of, you know, 150,000 frames in total, I had my set of 419 opening hands ready. 205 from paying players, 214 from F2P accounts. Both sets were based on games from at least five different accounts each, including two of my own, one F2P1 and one on which I paid money. So the first thing I counted was how often each of these groups went first. If I was rigging the game in favor of paying players, I'd have them go first more often, as it's been confirmed to positively influence win rate in studies with sample sizes that dwarf my humble 400. So our overall sample has 209 occurrences of going first, and 210 of going second. 
as close to 50% as we can get with an odd total. But is there a difference between our paying and non-paying player groups here? Not in any significant way. Paying players went first 103 times and second 102 times, while F2P ones went first 106 times and second 108 times. Both of these are so extremely close to the expected 50-50 split that it's almost not worth looking into it further. By the way, it might look as if there was a difference if we expressed these as percentages instead and zoomed in real close. If I intended to mislead, which unfortunately is something that a small number of data professionals may want to do online, I might say that, hey, paying players go first 50.24% of the time, and F2P only 49.53, so there is a difference. But seriously, I cannot stress this enough, this is the smallest possible difference. One game going in the other direction in our sample of over 400 would have gotten us an even 50-50. So using our data, I'm near certain that there isn't a bias against going first for F2P players. Now transitioning into the initial hunt quality hypothesis, I feel like this one is going to be quite a bit more interesting. A lot of the, let's not call them ravings, a lot of the opinions I saw online refers to not getting the cards the player wants while the opponent gets all the perfect ones. Controlling that sort of stuff at scale would require us to run a machine learning algorithm of some sort that would calculate which card combinations appearing in the initial seven influence win rate positively or negatively for a given deck, the definition of that deck based on the performance of the cluster of decks most closely related to it, and then it would generate, you know, shitty or premium hands based on that analysis, likely also having to take into account the matchup because that might change things. I'm about 40% sure that I could write something like that if I had access to enough data. It would probably be glacially slow and would likely triple Arena's server costs. We're talking about the complexity on the level of, like, Netflix's recommendation algorithm, if we wanted to run this real-time. I don't see how covertly making paying players slightly happier might make up for the costs. So I'm going to use my expert's veto here and say that WotC are not doing that. But there is a simpler proposition that could accomplish a very similar thing. And that's messing with the ratio of land and non-land permanents in the initial seven. Because you see, the number of lands that you draw, especially the extremes, drawing very little of them or a lot of them, otherwise known as mana screw or mana flood, those are very good predictors of losing. So a much easier way to set up this shitty slash premium hand generation engine would be to mess with how often each group of players gets the ideal number of lands in their seven. Even if they mulligan a bad hand away, they will be starting with six or five cards then, which would also accomplish the purpose of slightly lowering their win rate on the sly. So I pulled the land numbers for each hand in our 419. I also pulled the land to cards in deck ratios for the decks that they belonged to. This was a painfully manual process, by the way, but I hope I will be soothed by the dulcet tones of you clicking that subscribe button. Now, for each of these decks, I calculated the expected average number of lands in a hand of seven drawn from that deck based on how many lands the deck runs overall, specifically using, scary name, hypergeometric probability. I might make a standalone video about that one someday, but what it resulted in and what ultimately matters to us was a single number for each deck. How many lands on average we expect to see drawing our initial seven from that deck. For a 60 card deck with 26 lands, that's 3.03 lands on average. Let's round that to an even three, since it's quite close. For every hand drawn from a 26 land deck, I would compare the number of lands drawn to the expected three and note the difference. A hand with two lands, that's a difference of one. A hand with four lands, also a difference of one. A hand with three lands, as expected, no difference, or a difference of zero. 
My thinking was that if there is a large difference in how many lands either group gets, you know, much less, much more, both, but definitely much something, this would allow us to catch these differences. And the results of comparing what we would expect to draw from these decks in a fully random environment and what we've actually drawn... Drumroll, please... Both groups drew on average half a land more than was expected, 0.509 more than expected for F2P players, 0.522 for paying ones. So this is interesting in two ways. First, there seems to be no difference between the two groups, at least on this metric. So our initial hypothesis looks a bit shaky. But more interestingly, across our entire 400 plus sample, we drew about half a land more than expected which seems a bit sus. So perhaps there isn't a bias along the axis that we initially expected, but I feel like there is definitely something here. So I put on my tinfoil hat. Let's pretend I am putting it on. I was supposed to have one prepared for the video, but I forgot until now. So I put it on and delved deeper. Now, it's been an oft-repeated open secret in MTG circles that the Arena Shuffler isn't actually fully random, but that it features some form of smoothing, some feature behind the scenes that limits the number of unplayable hands that get shown to players. To see if our sample shows evidence of that, I simulated the expected number of 0 land, 1 land, 2 land, etc. hands that we should get from the decks in our sample. This is that distribution. For example, you can see that we would expect about 3% of hands drawn to be zero landers, a tragic occurrence that you would mulligan instantly. Across 419 hands, that's a bit over 12 zero landers we would expect to see. Now let's compare these with our actual distributions. First of all, we can probably safely collapse our two categories into one bigger group, since we haven't found much differences between them. If we look at the actual numbers of lands drawn per group, there is a slight difference in one of them getting more two landers, while the other gets a bit more threes. But that's mostly due to one featuring more 20 and 21 land decks than the other. So I'm going to assume there isn't a huge difference, collapse them, and see what happens. Now to overlay this graph into our expected one, and let's compare. No zero landers, way less one landers than expected, ditto for four landers, five and six land hands nowhere to be seen, but that is very much made up by the higher count of twos and threes. So what's up? One theory that I've heard, I want to say it might have been in one of CGB's videos, as to how the smoothing might work, is that Arena draws multiple hands and shows you the one that's the closest to the expected land average. That sort of thing is not unheard of in games, by the way, because actual randomness often doesn't appear random enough to human beings, so averaging it out a bit on the sly can help with overcoming that psychological hurdle. So I simulated the expected distributions for the same decks if we drew two hands for each, and only kept the one that was closer to the expected number of lands we should get from the deck. So if we drew a 3-lander and a 1-lander for our 26-land deck, which again has an expected land count of 3, we would keep the 3 lander only. And this already looks closer, since our expected values for most decks are somewhere between 1.88 and 3.15, the smoothing technique behaved as intended, smoothing out the outliers, especially 0 land and 6 land hands, the worst ones to get. And if we drew 3 hands and chose one using the same criteria, our distributions would start to look pretty similar, wouldn't they? Five land hands would get near totally eliminated, as was the case in our experimental sample, one landers would drop to very occasional, it just seems to fit quite well. And any imperfections may very well be the result of our sampling or the actual functionality being a bit more complex. So to conclusively answer the question from the intro, is MTG Arena rigged? I don't think so, at least not according to my definition of rigged. There doesn't seem to be a huge difference between F2P players going first more or less often than their paying counterparts. They also don't seem to get mana screwed or mana flooded more often than those who pay. 
There is, of course, the discovery of the shuffler working in a slightly non-standard way, but I don't think that's to anybody's benefit. Maybe apart from, like, the people who are aware of it and choose to go a bit greedy on lands during deck building as a result. But I feel like that's super minor. I've been Simon from Games Deconstructed. Let me know in what ways you'd rig Arena if you had access to the source code and the grudge against somebody, and maybe press that subscribe and like button while you're at it. Thanks a lot for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.